Hi, everyone. Welcome to this talk. How's the sound in the back? So I can't hear like the... All right, perfect. Uh, let's get started. Has anyone here ever built an application where they stored password in plain text in a database? Yeah, we've got like half the people. That's good. You're following the great examples of the great players of this world, right? <laughs> All right. Um, as developers, sometimes we do that. We, we, we have this really cool idea, like, I want to build this new social network thingy, um, and I'm going to revolutionize the world. And we just want to jump into our, our code, like the real core of our code. Uh, but the first thing that you need to do, right, is like that, that sign-up screen and that login screen and that uh, users, you know, you'll need a forgot password screen. And, and there's all those steps and all that stuff that you need to do. And then you, may, you have to make sure all of that stuff is also secured and so on and so on and so on. And next thing you know, you're two weeks into your project and all you have is a login screen. I have like four or five GitHub repos that are pretty much like that. Um, so, so we want to get uh, started with the real things. And, and I was doing that all the time, and I was like always redoing my, my login stuff. I was like, there has to be a better way. Uh, so that's when I started looking into OAuth. Um, and when I discovered OAuth, um, it was like just a bunch of charts with arrows and very dry language. Um, so I went back to storing passwords in plain text. Um, but eventually, I got this new job a few months ago. Um, at Auth0, and that's basically what we do. We have OAuth as a service. But I kind of had to learn about it. Um, so, uh, so that's what I did. And ever since I kind of understood how it works, it's like, oh, this is the best thing ever. So here I am today talking about this now. So very quickly, a little bit about me. Um, I always wear the same clothes at the conferences. <laughs> Um, I, I come from Toronto, Canada. That's where I live right now. I, I am French-Canadian, though, so you might notice a slight accent there. Um, if you ever want to reach me, Twitter is always the best way. I'm very excited whenever I have Twitter notifications, uh, so by all means, and I tend to answer very quickly. And I work, like I said, as a technical evangelist for Odd Zero. Uh, working as a technical evangelist is one of the best jobs ever, um, I think. Oh, I forgot those. Eh, here it is. All right. Uh, working as a technical evangelist is, is a very interesting thing. Um, basically, what I do uh, for a living is that I learn about cool stuff. So recently, I got into learning Python. Um, and then I go at various conferences and just share that knowledge that I've learned. Um, so I get to travel a lot. I go to a lot of different places. And, and that's kind of a nice little perk that I have. And when I'm at home, I'm, I'm a bit of a foodie. I really like good food. Uh, one of my very close friends actually used to be a professional chef. Uh, so whenever we get together, you know, we, we have all these, these great meals. So most of my friends see me uh, and my life as being a traveler. Like, I go to all those fancy restaurants, right? Uh, but in reality, uh, it's a little bit from running from one meetup to the other. And I get a lot of meetup food. So um, and there's a little difference between this type of restaurant and the one I just showed before is that they'll usually ask me to pay before, right? I, like, they'll ask you to pay before you get a slice of pizza. And when I travel, I don't necessarily get some money, because it gets, it gets hard if you go to different countries and you need all those different currencies, um, especially if you go into the US, because um, they're all green and similar. Um, so it's really hard. I don't usually, usually have cash with me, uh, but I'll usually use a card, right? Makes sense. And we all use our cards every now and then. Um, it makes it a lot, a lot more easier for me as a user or as a buyer. Uh, but the restaurant itself doesn't care about the card. They, they don't know what to do with that. Uh, even if I provide them with my banking information, they don't care. They want the cash, right? Uh, so what they do is that they give me this machine. This machine will actually take care of validating who I am and eventually say uh, the pizza shop owner that I am good for that 99 cent and they can serve me that pizza. All right, so that's what OAuth is. So um, just like I said, if you, as a user, want to get a slice of pizza, you'll go to a restaurant. And the restaurant will need a way to validate who you say you are and that you actually have money in your bank account. So they'll redirect you by using a, a small machine into the bank. The bank will validate who you are and will tell the shop owner that, yes, you are, uh, you are good for that 99 cents. That's what OAuth is. Like, really, at the most basic way to put it, that's pretty much how it works. So instead of, of course, having a pizza, we have an API. And instead of having a bank, we have an authorization server. 
So you have a user trying to connect to an API. The API will not recognize you at first because you're not authenticated, so it will redirect you to an authorization server. And then the authorization server will provide you with some keys uh, in order to access the data on the API. Make sense? All right, but why would you do that? So it's all about delegation. Delegation. Or passing the puck, as we say home. Is that too much of a hockey reference? Anyways, uh, it's still getting access to different resources. So it's telling uh, an API that, yes, you can actually uh, give access to those resources to another person. Um, so let's just rewind a little bit and I look at traditional applications. So when I started working um, in the web world, uh, that was like in a previous millennium, um, I used to write a lot of PHP. And the way you'd write it is very easy. So you just have this, you know, this browser that will connect to a server. Um, and then the server will provide you with a login.php page. Um, and then in there, you will fill in your credentials, pass, pass that on to the server. Server will go to the database, validate everything. Very easy when it's in plain text. Um, and then send you back a, a session cookie. Session cookie would be an identifier of your session on the computer. So whenever you would pass this cookie, it would say, well, I am session number 123. And uh, the server would store for session 123, this is user X, and so on. So that worked well. So why should we change that? Well, in a world of stateless and RESTful applications, um, that paradigm doesn't work as, much, as well as it used to do. There's a few things. Uh, the, all the different devices that we use to connect to the internet now. Uh, so we have, um, of course, mobile phones. We kind of fix that with um, responsive design and so on. But uh, it still it doesn't work all the time, especially if you do native mobile development, uh, then that login PHP page won't necessarily work. Um, if you have conversational UIs, uh, that login PHP has abs makes absolutely no sense in a conversational UI. Who here ever did some PHP development? Oh, wow, a lot more than I thought. That's cool. It's cool that you've moved away from it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, if you did it like a few years back, it's getting a lot better with all the, the new frameworks, but if you did some PHP a few years ago, um, you know how much of a nightmare your code can become after a few years. Everything is just tangled. It's one big mess. And if you need to build a new application, your, your boss comes to you and says, hey, can you, we'll start this new project or new product. Um, extracting all the information that you have about the user from the old, old application is basically impossible. So you have to start from scratch all, all over again. And if you're lucky, you might be able to reuse, or you, you were maybe able to reuse the same database, but in most cases, you couldn't. So your, your customers would come into your website. They knew that both products came from the same company, but they still had to do that login process or sign up process all over again. Also, one of my favorite things of web development um, a few years back, like 20 years ago, was how you would connect to somebody else's API. So say you wanted to do some stuff on behalf of the user on their MySpace page. So you would take care of creating the login stuff for your, uh, for your, web, for your web application. And you know, you'd secure all the password and all that stuff for the users. But then you would ask the user, please give me your username and password for your MySpace page. And then you will need to send that to the server. So you would store all of those in plain text in your database. And of course, most of the time, it's the exact same password and username, right? Um, so that, that's definitely not the best way to do it. Um, and finally, we have like users have all of these different accounts already. They're tired of creating accounts. Um, and it's, it's been showed that users are getting tired of creating a new account for every single uh, application that they're using. Um, for example, you know, Medium. Um, I don't want to create an account on Medium. I want to read that blog post and get out as soon as I can. Uh, but you know, it's always asking me, like, you should register for an account. I'm like, no, I don't want to. So that's where OAuth comes into play, and that's where it kind of starts to help us. Now, we cannot talk about OAuth without going into the grants. So OAuth grants are basically the flows and how the information is shared between the machines. So OAuth itself is just a protocol that describes how machines should talk from, uh, between each other. Um, the standard itself is very, very vague. Uh, it's not defined, but it just kind of describes those flows, so there's no real way around it. But I'll try to avoid using uh, too much of a dry vocabulary and kind of show you how you can use OAuth to authenticate your users and your applications. 
So your user uh, logs into your web page, um, single page, web page or whatever, and then connects to a server, um, and they have a session open between the two. Now this server will try to access some data on, a, on an API. Uh, a good example of that would be uh, trying to read something on Twitter, for example, or to post some stuff on Twitter on your behalf. If you're not authenticated, the browser will redirect you to the authorization server. And this part is very important. You should always completely redirect your users to an authorization server and make sure that they are uh, the trusted entity to validate the user's identity. Once they're there, uh, the server will validate through username and password, uh, passwordless technology. Uh, if you were at my workshop yesterday, uh, it doesn't matter how they validate who you say you are, but they will validate you at some point. The authorization server will then send you an access code. And an access code is basically just a short string, uh, randomly generated, um, and it's short-lived, like it'll expire after a few seconds. So the single page application will send that access code to uh, your server, and then that server will exchange that access code for an access token. Like I said, a lot of charts, a lot of arrows. Um, hopefully it'll make some sense soon. So in exchange for that access token, you get an, uh, for that access code, you receive an access token as well as a refresh token. And that access token is your key to the API. It is what gives access to the resources on the API. Uh, so once you use it, uh, the, the, the server will be able to return you um, the, the information that you requested. So what's really important here is that uh, your browser never, your single page application or web application front end never actually had access to a user's credentials, never had access to a token, never had access to anything that has to do with the keys to your API. So it enables you to build application and really focus on you know, the actual application and not having to worry about all that secure information or sensitive information. Uh, access tokens will expire after a while, which is why we are sending also a refresh token to the server. So the server will be able to use a refresh token to get new access tokens, so you'll be able to uh, get a new one and get access to the data. I'll come back to tokens in a few seconds. Uh, so that works well, um, but most of the time, this gets a little bit complex. There's Typically, we will not use that server in the middle, and we'll have a front end that communicates directly with an API, right? That might be a little bit more uh, the type of application that you've seen. And if you're going to build something like this, um, you're just you know, going to bypass that whole thing and access the API directly. Now, it will work pretty much the same way. Uh, so you'll just connect to the authorization server. The front end will check if the user is authenticated or not. Uh, if he's not, redirect to the um, authorization server, and then you can validate the user's identity there. And if we're good to go, uh, we'll return directly the access token to the front end, and that, front, that access token will be able to access the API and get access to the data. Now it's very similar to the one that we've just seen. Uh, one of the big differences is that we don't have a refresh token, and you're also responsible for storing that key to the API. So if somebody gets a hold of that key, then they can actually impersonate your users, so you have to be a little bit more careful about that. So, about tokens, uh, I've mentioned two types already. I said access tokens, refresh tokens. What exactly is a token? So, an access token is, or actually a token is just a piece of digital information that you can use to share information between machines. That's all it is. An access token is the key to the API, so it really gives you access to a resource, and it's typically very short-lived, um, anywhere from a few minutes to a few hours. It really depends on your use case. The refresh token itself uh, will enable you to get new access tokens, and they are um, longer lived. They can be anywhere from days to months to years. But the nice thing about a refresh token is that they can be revoked. You might have seen this page on uh, which one is that? GitHub. Uh, GitHub, like you can see all the applications where you've used a, a Google sign-in. Uh, no, that's Google, not GitHub, sorry. Uh, so you can see all the applications that you, you've go, use, used Google to, to sign in, um, and you can revoke the access to the application. So that's exactly what we're doing. We're removing the refresh token so the application won't be able to connect uh, without you logging in, logging in back again. Same thing on GitHub. Uh, that page actually has a revoke button, so that's exactly the same vocabulary here. Tokens come in many different forms. If you're into the Microsoft world, uh, WS Federated is probably what you're going to use. Uh, if you're into XML, 
Um, SAML is what you'll have to use. You can use custom stuff. It doesn't really matter. Um, what I'm interested in or what I'll be kind of presenting here is JSON Web Tokens. JSON Web Tokens are just a standardized way to represent that information that you can share between users. So it looks like this. Um, at a first glance, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But you can see that there's uh, some points and there are dots, periods, uh, that split the JSON Web Token in three parts. So you have two JSON objects and a signature at the end. So let's take a look at the header more specifically. Uh, the header is this part here. And if you use the A to B function in your browser, you can actually decode it and you'll see that this is a JSON object. So it's only uh, Base64 encoded just for simplicity and making sure that it's easy to pass around. Same thing for the payload. Uh, so it's this part here in the middle. You can use A, A to B. You see that we have a JSON object as well. The information that goes into the payload is not really defined by the standard. There's a few reserved keywords that you should uh, only use for specific things, like sub in this case, which is typically the user ID. Um, but in general, it doesn't matter what you put in there. It's only information that you want to pass to another machine. Uh, oftentimes, you'll put some permissions and things like that. Finally, we have a signature. Uh, signature will uh, is just using the header as well as the payload, generates a signature, and that's what enables uh, the, the JSON Web Token to make sure that nobody has been able to tamper with it. If you have to play with JSON Web Tokens, JWT.io is a great resource. You basically just put in or paste in your JSON Web Token, and on the right you have all the information that is in it. Very, very useful if you play with authorization servers. Also note that the information there is not encrypted, so never put any sensitive information in your JSON Web Tokens. Let's look at some code very quickly. Um, so an authorization server and an API. Um, I've tried to write it, and, and I kind of understand concepts like this when I'm looking at some code. So I've tried to write like the simplest possible um, authorization server and API. Of course, it's definitely not um, an, an implementation that you should use in production, uh, namely because it uses uh, plain text passwords. But um, it kind of gives you the idea of how things work there. The authorization server, in this, in this case, I'm just using a Flask server. Uh, so you just import all of your, your things. You instantiate your server. And then you have your user, uh, your user database, uh, which makes sense. Um, and then you have two different routes on your uh, authorization server. So that's the, the basic minimum. So you'll have a first one, which will be a get to the uh, login route and a post to the login route. If we look at the get, basically the only thing that it does is that it will serve you a login form. Uh, there's not more than that, uh, so just some ugly HTML in there. Now, all of the magic happens in the, uh, in the post part. So we'll post our username and password to this login, to this route. And in here we have, um, we validate that the request is valid, so we check for the username. Is there a username? Is there a password? We'll check if uh, the request is valid. We'll check if we have a matching user in our database. And if we do, what we'll do here is that we'll create one of those JSON web tokens. So we'll use a library here uh, called uh, Jose that, that has a JWT method that you can use that will basically just take care of all of that for you. We'll just create a JSON web token with the payload that you define here. And then you give it a, sign or a secret key as well as the algorithm for the signature. And finally, you redirect the user once they're authenticated to the API or to the application where they were before, and you append the access code there. So the application will be able to take that access code and access the API. And then you start your server. From the API point of view, you do pretty much the same thing. So this is another server that runs, in this case, on the same machine, uh, but it could be on a completely different machine. Um, and you'll have an API. In this case, I have two different routes. Um, I have a public one as well as a private one. You'll see that they're both very, very similar. The only difference being that this one has another decorator or a wrapper for the, uh, the, the route, and this one requires authentication. And then you can start the API. The uh, wrapper itself uh, just uses a lot of boilerplate code, uh, but basically what it does is that it will check for the presence of a header, authorization header. Um, if there's one, it will try to decode that token, and then it will uh, throw an error message or an error if um, the token is expired, if it doesn't not have the right permissions, and so on. All right. 
On the front end now, so we have three different machines, right? And we have the front end. The only thing that you need to do is to add this header to your request. So really, you just add an authorization header, it says bearer, and you pass it the JSON web token. So what did this look like in practice? Let's take a very quick look. So we've got this API here that has a public route um, that just generates some random stuff. Um, as you can see, very, very random. Here it is. OK, so we've got this API. We've got this route that generates random um, clickbait headlines. And HTTP cats, because I love HTTP cats. Um, the other one is a protected route. So if I try to access the data on it, it will just, the API will return me a 401, because I'm not authenticated. I do not uh, have the token um, as part of my request. So when I click login, I'm redirected to the authorization server. You might have noticed that the port change on top here. If I use my very secure username and password, I log in, the authorization server takes care of validating that I am who I say I am, and then redirects me to the uh, front end uh, with the access token. So I have this access token here. Come on. There it is. And if you use jwt.io, you can kind of see what's in that token. So that's the one that we've created with the code that I've shown. All right, so now that I have this token, uh, I can actually now access those awesome headlines. And if we take a look at our requests here, we will see that we have an authorization header uh, right here with the access token. So basically, the only thing that you need to do uh, is make sure that you pass this access token with your connections. All right. So like I said, it's all about delegation, delegating. Um, you know, if, you, if you're working on your back end, you're building your API, you don't want to be bothered with all of that stuff, right? You don't want to, um, you, you don't want to deal with all of that sensitive information. Uh, you only want to work on the business logic and whatever data that your API should be providing. So you can kind of delegate all of that security stuff to the experts and the people that actually do care about it. If you're working on the front end, um, same, same type of thing, right? You don't want to be bothered with uh, making sure that you have like a, a good connection and so on. So you can just pass along this uh, token and it makes it really, really easy to develop. So that kind of takes care of authorization. Uh, but there's also this whole aspect of authentication. You want to know who the user is, not only what does he have permission to access. So like I said, I do travel a bit. Um, and when I travel, I'll usually go to a hotel. Um, and I'll usually try to avoid this type of hotel. Um, you know those places where they had like those guest book and you would just sign your name um, and people would disappear? Uh, I'll try to avoid that. So I'll try to go to a place like this, you know, middle you know, type of, of hotel. And they'll ask me for a piece of ID when I come in, right? Um, they want to validate who I, who I am and just in case I trash the whole place, uh, you know, they want to be able to find me. One piece of ID I could use pretty, mu pretty much anywhere in the world is my passport. But a passport is a very sensitive piece of information. I don't want to share all of that information with anyone. They could scan a passport and steal it from me. Um, so what else could I use? We have social security cards in Canada, which is just about the most useless piece of ID that you can have. Uh, it has nothing apart from a name and a number. Uh, it doesn't prove who I am in any shape or form. Uh, but it is still a very, very important piece of information. Uh, if somebody gets a hold of that, that's not my real I mean, social security number. Uh, but they could, in theory, use uh, all of that information to get credit cards on my behalf and so on. So the one that I typically use is my driver's license. And I find it really, really interesting because uh, this is a driver's license from Quebec. Um, and you'll notice you know, it has all this, this information, uh, like um, you know, name, date of birth, and picture. Uh, but it's all in French. Like everything is in French, date de naissance, uh, class, uh, even the information in the back. But it will be accepted everywhere in the world because it kind of looks like a legit piece of information. Like there's all of those holograms. There's a phone number that you can call. Like so, people will kind of trust that card. So that's pretty much what OpenID Connect will do for you. Um, so OpenID Connect is is built on top of OAuth 2.0. Uh, it's just one extra call that you'll make to the server. So once you have your access token 
you'll be able to uh, make an extra call to the authorization server and ask for the open ID information. So you'll simply add open ID um, as part of the scope or the, the things that you're requesting to the server. Uh, you can ask for a profile, email, and so on. If you want to see how OpenID Connect works, uh, there's a great website, OpenID Connect, uh, that kind of gives you the step-by-step, -step, and it kind of really helped me to understand what's going on and what piece of information do, can I get uh, through all of that. So really, it's all about delegation. It's not that I don't care about security, it's that, that I don't want to deal with it. Um, so I can actually delegate all of that stuff to teams of, that, uh, that are um, you know, specialized in that and I actually enjoy working on that. So I encourage you to use OAuth servers. There's a bunch of them publicly available. Uh, stuff like Google. Google will let you access their OAuth server to validate your users. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, and so on. <clears throat> Odd zero. Um, uh, so I'll just leave you with a few resources. Um, so uh, JWT, uh, OIT, uh, OIDC, as well as the code samples, everything is there. Um, but I'll tweet that. Actually, it should be out in about three minutes. And that's all I had. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joel. Thank you. Are there any known security issues or problems when it comes to OAuth? <laughs> yes, there are. There are security issues with everything. Like, if you want to be fully secure, um, you know, unplug yourself from the internet. That's the only solution. Uh, so there are there are different risks. Uh, the primary risk with Open or, or OAuth is uh, ha how you handle the tokens. If anybody gets a hold of that token, uh, they can impersonate you. Uh, or your users, uh, so you have to be very, very careful about that piece of information and how you handle that. So um, use HTTPS for starters. Uh, don't store it anywhere. Don't store it in a cookie. Don't store it in um, in local storage. Just keep it in memory. Uh, there's a few good practices around that, um, but the, yeah, that's the the, the biggest uh, or the weakest link uh, in your OAuth. Is OAuth a good choice for usage uh, in IoT or IOE? Is OAuth good? Yes, it is. Um, I am not as familiar with the machine-to-machine uh, -machine flows, but there are flows that are made or grants that are made specifically for uh, IoT and machine-to-machine -machine communication uh, that you can use for that. Can't OAuth be a privacy concern, through, though? OAuth providers can and will profile you by knowing all the apps you use. So... The, the only one that knows what app you're using is the authorization server, uh, and it, comes to, uh, it, uh, it all comes to trust, right? Um, so it might be a good thing. Maybe Google knows what app you're using. Um, maybe they're trustable, and they won't share that information with anyone. I don't know. Um, it could be an issue. Um, so yeah, make, make your research. Be careful what you're using. Um, how does your API-based uh, based app when your auth server is another app or third-party provider? Should we just always mock login state? Yes, you can mock those using um, a fake JWT. Or so you can just generate your own JSON web token and use that for testing purposes. Can you compare SAML versus JSON web tokens and when uh, would you use SAML? Um, no, I can't. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, SAML is really an XML-based thing. Like it's this huge monster, and like I only looked it up once, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm never gonna touch that." Uh, so, so that's all I can tell you about SAML, really. Yeah, we have a little joke here. Um, is storing secrets in the Perl module with some logic really considered insecure? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> did you, uh, one referring to the session yesterday. Did you fix the authorization problems for a practical session yesterday? Yes, I did. Who asked the question? Oh, come on. <laughs> there you are. Uh, yes, yeah, so I gave a workshop yesterday uh, showing passwordless authentication and just nothing worked. It was like the most disastrous uh, workshop I ever gave. Uh, so it ended up being the firewall blocking access to our email servers. Um, so, you, anyways, so it wasn't me, just saying. It was the fire, <laughs> firewall's fault. It can you worked somehow, on my machine. <laughs> can you somehow revoke the token, JSON Web Token? You can revoke refresh tokens. You cannot revoke um, access tokens. So depending on what you're building, and that's, why I said, that's when I said you know, it depends on your use case. Um, if you have a very secure application, if you have a banking application, for example, 
Um, you know, probably you'll want very, very short-lived uh, access tokens like five minutes, but you'll refresh and you'll get another access token every five minutes, and then you can revoke your refresh token. Uh, but if you have application with less uh, sensitive information uh, for the sake of user's experience and a bunch of different things, you might want to keep them longer lived uh, if you don't mind as much. And the final one, is there a way to use OAuth without the need to trust the identity server? Uh, you can build your own identity server, I, though, although I probably wouldn't recommend that. So. Thank you so much, Joel. Thank you very much.